This is Black Market Leadership, the underground resource for disruptors and status quo breakers. I got all right. I got one more question for you before I, before I have a question about your book. <laughs> it's, it's all about Churchill. So um, there's one lesson, uh, not one lesson, but there, there's one thing that that's always I've always found it very, just very interesting. And near the end of the war, when the Allies are uh, have crossed the Rhine, uh, the Soviet Union uh, is attacking from the east. Right before Germany falls, one thing that this sticks out to me is that when the, when Eisenhower and the Allies and the Americans decide to go to the Southern Redoubt, you know, in my mind, Eisenhower had just a military focus. But it was Churchill who saw the political danger of the Soviet Union. It was Stalin who saw the political dangers of, of the West coming back to, to the Soviet Union. And I've always been shocked that, like, here we are, you know, as Americans, here we are taking part of this, but we're so practical. We're so here. We're just so here and now. And Churchill could see beyond the horizon. And apparently so could Stalin. Um, I was just – that's one thing that it's just always been fascinating to me that um, – it seems to me that by that end, by that time in the, the war, the you know the American industrial might has grown. If it, it, the 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 power, the influence that the the United Kingdom had uh, has been diminished, and it seems like almost Churchill had lost his gambling power, his leverage by that yeah. time. I mean, I, I mean, I think you're right. You're raising a number of things. Uh, you know, uh, America's priority was to defeat Nazi Germany. You know, and and it, and it wasn't America's responsibility to, to oversee the peace. I mean, it did with the Marshall Plan and everything else, obviously, and also the you know the creation of NATO and, and safeguarding Central Europe. But at the time, obviously, uh, Roosevelt Truman's goal was to to ensure Nazi Germany was defeated, uh, and that was pretty much it. And also, of course, I think their view was shaped by America's involvement during the First World War. You know, with the defeat of the Kaiser. And of course, Churchill came at it with a practical politicians. Head and a hist you know historian head, in that he knew what a threat Soviet Union posed to Poland. You know, Poland had become independent as a result of the end of the First World War. So he'd watched, obviously, how Hitler and Stalin had very cynically divided Poland between them at the start of the Second World War. I mean, a lot of people tend to forget that, don't they? They think, oh, the Second World War was sparked by Hitler invading Poland. And you go, well, yes, it was. <clears throat> French, you know, the French and France and Britain had a treaty with Poland to help defend them, and that dragged us into the war. And that's, you know, that's how it happened. Of course, people kind of have this picture, and then they say, "Oh, and then Hitler attacked the Soviet Union," and you kind of, and he did it from Poland. So you have this sort of mental picture of the Germans are sat in Poland up against the Soviet Union's border, and they invade. But of course, that's not the case because you know, September 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union divided Poland in half. Uh, and the Soviets got to occupy the eastern half of Poland. Now, of course, that suited the Soviet Union and particularly Stalin because he had this concept of forward defence. You know, he always argued, particularly after the First World War, that the Soviet Union should be defended forward of its own borders. You know, don't let don't let their own soil become a battlefield. Do it forward. And I think Churchill understood that, and he understood at the end of the Second World War that Stalin would do his utmost to create a security buffer, a security zone in Eastern Europe to prevent Germany from attacking the Soviet Union for a third time, or you know, obviously it was Imperial Russia during the First World War, but to attack, stop the Germans attacking Mother Russia a third time, because obviously Germany is the main central power in the middle of Europe. I mean, it, it, you know, population-wise and geographically, it's the biggest country. So Churchill and his, uh, sorry, Stalin and his generals, obviously, if you're Russian, took the right decision of going, we are going to create a series of puppet states in Eastern Europe to safeguard the Soviet Union. And of course, they did that with the creation of communist governments in Eastern Europe and the creation of the Warsaw Pact. And again, as far as the Russians were concerned, or the Soviets, those countries deserved that because they had signed it, you know, again, a lot of people don't realise that Eastern Europe fought the Germans. So in Stalin's mind, that was punishment for Eastern Europe siding with Germany that they would become Soviet satellites in the name of defending the Soviet Union. And I think, you know, uh, Churchill understood that. And obviously, it was at 1948 with his Missouri speech about, you know, an Iron Curtain descending across Europe. He understood 
uh, what was happening and the ramifications that would have, because of course, by that stage, Soviet Union was armed to the teeth, and had an awful lot of men under arms and therefore posed a very clear and present danger to Western Europe. Um, and obviously, of course, slowly but surely everyone recognized that threat. NATO was born and, you know, and then, and then we had the Cold War on our hands. But I think from the start, Hitler recognized that. And ironically, a lot of Germans did because as Nazi Germany was slowly imploding, a lot of German generals seriously thought when the British and American armies turned up in Germany, they would side with them to fight, you know, the Soviets or the Bolsheviks as they knew them. And actually that the war would continue against the Soviet Union. I mean, thank heavens that didn't. But, you know, even someone like Patton, yeah. you know, firmly believed that, well, again, Patton understood the threat, you know, but obviously they were our allies. Okay, they were strange bedfellows. And I think the failing actually both Roosevelt and Churchill had was that they thought through sheer willpower and charisma that they could persuade um, Stalin of the merits of democracy. Of course, the pair of them were offered to a hiding to nothing, and they both developed very good relationships with him. But obviously, while Stalin was you know, extolling the virtues of fraternal friendship and getting drunk with them, he had a very clear strategic idea of what he wanted to do, to safeguard his own homeland. And you can't blame him for that. Uh, but obviously it created a, a major headache for the rest of us. So I think, going back to your original point, yes, I think you're right. You know, uh, Roosevelt, Truman and Eisenhower, their goal was the defeat of Nazi Germany. And I, and I don't think um, lots of folks gave much thought of what, what would happen next. I mean, exactly the same thing happened in the Far East, obviously, with the defeat of Japan. I mean, that then created problems for us because... You ended up with Korea divided and North Korea a communist state, uh, you know, despite America's best efforts to prop up nationalist Chinese in, in China. You know, Mao took over and China became a communist state. So actually, the you know, the, the, the victory for the Second World War tasted good, but the aftermath was quite bitter uh, uh, because of what happened. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd be fair, I'm not sure there was any great way we could have stopped any of it, quite frankly, you know, the. That was the real politique of the time. But, but yes, I, I agree with your observation that Churchill, I think, understood the world that we were inheriting and it wasn't going to be a very pleasant place. I mean, by good fortune, the Cold War never got hot. But again, that's a fallacy because it did. You know, as we know, Vietnam, Korea, you know, uh, all the Bush Wars in Africa. I mean, basically, the West and the East fought it out on other people's territory, which Uncle Joe Stalin, of course, would have approved of, you know, that... that, that <laughs> The, the Cold War was fought by proxy elsewhere. Unfortunately, you know, Europe was 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 saved yet another bloody conflict. So, what was the biggest lesson in 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 this venture of yours, in this odyssey of writing your <laughs> the new book? What was the biggest lesson that just popped out and and that you were surprised and learning? Um, I think so. Sort of leadership wise in, in Churchill's terms was his sheer drive and determination, because from the very beginning, he had a clear goal of what he wanted to do, and what he wanted to achieve. And I think he became soldier largely to please his father. As, as we all know, he died. He, his father died quite young. And his father never had much um, faith in Churchill's academic abilities, whereas actually there was nothing wrong with his academic abilities, as far as I can see, he was just like any other schoolboy, you know, struggled to concentrate, wasn't terribly interested, but that didn't make him a dunderhead, which is what I think his father thought he was. So in a way, this is his father. He, he, he joined the army, but he wanted to emulate his father and become a politician. That was his clear goal. Uh, and one of the reasons he joined the army was because he knew that if he gained gallantry awards, that would get him publicity, that would bring him to public attention, and that would help a political campaign. So in his early life, he took an inordinate number of risks in the hope of winning the Victoria Cross or any other military gallantry awards, because he knew if he was, you know, Winston Churchill VC, you know, the, 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 that the Victoria Cross does not get handed out very often. He knew he had those initials after his name. It would draw attention to him. It would show that he was a war hero, you know, an accomplished soldier or a veteran. Um, and, and, and he... So that's what he desperately wanted to, to win. When it became apparent, despite his best efforts, I mean, he was nearly killed on numerous occasions. He was constantly exposing himself to fire by his own admission, quite often in a desperate bid to get noticed by his officers. I mean, you know, again, <laughs> impetuousness of youth. It's that, you know, he took all these chances and risks quite often bravely. You know, uh, there's one instance where he helped 
save a wounded officer under fire. You know, he did that because the man was down and that was what was required. But he, but he did do a lot of sort of grandstanding, you know, to get noticed. But once he realised actually that his military career wasn't going anywhere in a hurry, he, became, he began to get very impatient. And that's when he cut his military career uh, shorter. You know, he hoped to emulate, I think, his, his ancestor, you know, Don Churchill, the, the, the Duke of Blenheim, you know, who was a famous British military, military commander. And I think he was always inspired by him. So I think he had a, a sort of vague hope that he might emulate in, him in some way, which, of course, he did eventually by becoming prime minister. But, but, I, but I think he, for a while he harboured maybe that he, he, he would become this heroic soldier figure, maybe rise up through the ranks. But I think because he was young, he began to get impatient and, and thought he didn't want to do his time in uniform. So he, he, he decided to take a shortcut or made a tactical decision or even a strategic decision that actually he, he would pursue politics, which is what he did. So he sort of eased himself out of the military. You know, uh, he, he resigned his commission, uh, fought an election, lost, became a journalist and ended up a, you know, what we would call now a paramilitary, he went off to South Africa as a war correspondent and also, again, a soldier, you know, continued to mix that, that writing with soldiering. Uh, and again, of course, that, that, that got, him, got him noticed. And of course, the primary thing that propelled him into uh, public consciousness then was, of course, his escape from the prisoner of war camp in South Africa, you know, when he was captured by the Boers, because that, that, that daring escape and his, his remarkable return captured everyone's imagination. So he was plastered on the front pages around the world. And um, again, it's one of those sort of symmetry things is that when he escaped from the prison camp, he uh, hid out in a mine for a while, and it turned out that one of the workers there was in English and had come from Oldham, which was one of the British parliamentary constituencies. He'd fought and failed. So, of course, there was that nice, you know, and of course, that chap then wrote back to Oldham, told his family. And of course, I, I'm going, you know, I'm going from memory now, but I think that was his first seat that he then went back and, and, and won it. So, in a way, he created his own luck, but also he. You know, he was his own driving force for his for his destiny. You know, as we started discussing, so he he, he was pushing his career and his reputation and, and the myth. You know, I think by his own uh, own admission, he was he was he was peddling a myth. Um, but he also had just incredible good luck. You know, um, the, the liberal leader Lloyd George, you know, took him under his wing, and I think he was a major mentor for Churchill politically. Also, of course, gave him quite a number of um, you know senior senior political posts, and all those helped. You know, forged Churchill into the man that he'd become by his sixties and, and nineteen forty, when he 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 was, you know, poised to take that 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 one job that then, of course, not only propelled him into international recognition, but also propelled him so firmly into the history books. Um, I can't remember how long ago it was about a decade or a couple of decades ago. Uh, they did a TV poll in the UK about you know who's who's the most famous well-recognised Britain, and, and it was Churchill. You know, everyone to this day, you know, most folks in this country would be hard-pressed to name half our politicians now, but, <laughs> but Churchill has lodged himself in, in everyone's psyche. Sadly, increasingly, he's come under fire, but, you know, he, he it, what he did, I think it's just quite remarkable. I remember, you know, you were saying at the start of the interview, was I daunted by taking on such a challenging figure and, and yes I was you know you, you want to do him justice uh, you want to try and bring a new perspective to the man you want to be balanced that's the thing as a writer you know you've got to be you know this isn't a hatchet job and it's not hero worshipping it has to be somewhere in the middle you know I want you to see him warts and all but I, I remember I was fortunate enough to go around the cabinet war rooms of the Churchill war rooms in London which is the underground uh, complex from where he, he partially ran the second world war this bunker complex uh and i and i you know i did a research trip there and had a look round, and, and i must say after you've seen one comp camp bed in a windowless brick cell room underground you know you've seen them all but what they have got there which is well well worth a visit is this quite remarkable museum in the middle of the of the you know of the underground system they built this lovely Churchill museum and his, lay, his life is laid out for you to see. And they've got all these marvellous exhibits, his uniforms, his clothing, his firearms, uh, first editions of all his books, um, uh, you know, and it's interactive from his films and all sorts of things. And you just stand there and it goes back to what I said earlier. And it makes you wonder, you think, what have I been doing with my life? Because how did this, this man 
jam in so much. You know, he, he lived a long and rewarding life. He was, what, 90, 90 old when he died. So, you know, he, he lived a long life, but he, he, he just managed to cram in so much, you know. And, um, and, and he would argue, well, he didn't do anything for 10 years because he had 10 years in the wilderness where he was out of the political office. I mean, he, he, he wrote books and, you know, and painted and did all sorts of other things. So it wasn't like he didn't do anything. But, you know, but, but politically, he had a, had a decade out. And again, that, that makes it all the more remarkable that he felt able and comfortable to assume the mantle of prime minister in, in 1940. I mean, Chamberlain actually, of course, had eased him back into office because he gave him the role of first sea lord. I mean, I think Chamberlain felt it was better to have Churchill on the cabinet, you know, where he could keep an eye on him than on the back benches being a damn nuisance like he'd always been, you know. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think it, it, it's his phenomenal drive. That's what I took away from doing the book. Um, do I think he did a good job? Damn right I do. Um, did did he live up to being master and commander? Yes. And, and one thing I did do with that is I, I illustrated that, yes, with uh, commentary from his contemporaries. So, you know, I used a lot of his folks, you know, because I wanted them to talk. It's all right, me coming to that conclusion. But, but what did his contemporaries feel? So all his chiefs of staff, his generals, you know, a lot of them, they sort of had a love-hate relationship with him, you know, uh, that the, 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 they expected him, but he drove them crazy. But a lot of them said, yes, he was the right man for the right moment. And overall, he did a good job. You know, if only he'd listened a bit more because on a number of campaigns, in fact, quite a few campaigns, he, he, he got it wrong. But even they felt that as, you know, political marshal, military commander, he, he'd done a good job. I mean, I don't, as I said when we began, I honestly don't know who else could have done it. The political leaning was Lord Halifax, but he was a member of the House of Lords. So constitutionally, he couldn't really become prime minister because he's, he's chosen from the commons. As you know, we have a, you know, a, a two house system, a bit like America. Um, they could have passed legislation to allow Halifax to do the job. But I don't think Halifax, Halifax wanted, wanted it. You know, I, I, I think he's a poison chalice. I know in recent years, there's been a line of thought that said, actually, they put Churchill up for a fall, but they chose him because they thought he would make a mess of it very quickly and therefore would get replaced. But of course, that didn't happen. He faced several votes of no confidence, but he, each time he won those, hands down. And now, if he'd lost them, obviously, then there would have been a question that we replaced him. But of course, when a country's in the middle of a war, the last thing you want is a, is a major leadership change. I mean, that because obviously that's what happened to America because you had Truman obviously take over towards the end of the war. Um, you know, And then we had that with... Um, Clement Attlee, you know, Labour won at the end of the war. So there was a change of administration just as it came to the end. But fortunately for the Allies, they had that, you know, continuity from start to finish. And, and of course, in terms of running a war or running anything, you need, you know, you need that leadership. It's important. I tell you, uh, I am so excited to read this. You just inspired me. What a great, <laughs> Thank just, you. what a great, you know, I, I, I can really see this. You know, you know, I do a, a lot of leadership and executive coaching. I, yeah. I, I feel like I'm going to be using this book as an example of, of required reading because the idea of purpose, of driving forward, of, yeah. uh, of uh, even altering path, deviating, but you're still on that same general highway. Yeah. Uh, wow. Wow. Uh, you boy, know, he had what was that saying? You know, success is not final. Um, failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. I'm paraphrasing here. But, but, but basically, he said, you know, you because you achieve something, that's not the end of it. You know, you should keep on achieving something. And if it doesn't go wrong, then you shouldn't lose heart. You should press on. You know, and again, as you're saying, it's, that's a prime lesson for business is that you, you have to have that ability to dust yourself off. And, you know, Churchill suffered terrible maulings while he was a politician. You know, um, there were a lot of a lot of things happened during his political career that he was held responsible for. Uh, you know, the man had a heart. He felt bad for that. I mean, prime example, again, is Gallipoli or Singapore. Both those events haunted him for the rest of his life because he knew that he'd made bad decisions. And there were a lot of other things that he was held responsible for, which he wasn't entirely to blame for. But, but, but he, you know, he took, he took that on his shoulders. So it was that ability to, you know, I think it's these American expressions, it's to roll the, pun roll the punches, you know, but, that, that he kind of learned to duck and dive. That if, if you want to be a success in something, then you mustn't lose heart. And, and, and he very firmly did that. Um, even when he lost the election at, at the end of the war, I mean, he, 
he seemed quite stir cool with that, I think. You know, um, it was a bit of a slap in the face because obviously he led the country to victory. He naturally assumed and so did the Tory party that they would get voted in, into power. But it, 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 it didn't work like that. But again, he appreciated that the country wanted to change. You know, it had all those years of war. Now is, you know, time to rebuild. Uh, kind of the piece. So, and also, of course, he was quite old by then, so I think probably. <laughs> but, but again, of course, he dusted himself off and came back. You know, he then won another general election and did another term on his own terms as as, as prime minister. So, I mean, his his staying power was just just remarkable. I mean, you know, I, I, genius is a word bandied around. I don't think he was a genius, but he was certainly a polymath. You know, he. He, his, his breadth of knowledge and understanding were quite remarkable and, 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 and his drive, that was the thing. And, and I think the important thing, like, you know, with Eisenhower, with Roosevelt, that they, they shouldered the burden of command. You know, they understood what was required of them um, and they got on with the job. Churchill did that, you know, that it, I mean, the stresses and strains must have been uh, enormous, you know, and, and these times when, you know, mental health is very much on, on, on you know, in the forefront of people's thinking. You just think, how did he not have a nervous break? You know, I, the, the <clears throat> stresses uh, and strains. I mean, on all of them, on all the commanders during the Second World War, you, the stresses and strains on them just must have been enormous. That, that, that um, you know, command of life and death all the time. You know, last time you and I talked, uh, we, uh, I, we were talking about the Battle uh, of, uh, of uh, Cal- the Calais Pocket. Um, yes. And I remember reading uh, a while ago, but I remember reading... Uh, Oh no! Uh, it, I, it was pr- previous. It, it was up to D Day. Excuse me, up to D Day, and how Ro- uh, Churchill had some real reservations, and I, I can't remember. I, he had a discussion with with someone that you you're, you're probably. I mean, you obviously know this, but he had a discussion, and, he, and I think the Americans were were we were nervous that he was backing off, that he was too nervous to do this to, to do the invasion uh, in England, but. He had a Churchill had said, I've been having these dreams of thousands of Brits uh, of our of our countrymen dying yes. in the channel. Yes, no, you're right. That was D Day. And again, of course, that's because he was haunted by Gallipoli. He had this image that the, the landings would be a bloodbath. I mean, as we know, Omaha was. Uh, but yeah, he he you know, Eisenhower, Roosevelt, uh, and Churchill, they'd given um, Stalin a pledge they would open the second front and it and it just kept lapsing you know uh so a chain of events was was you know set off I, and the I, allies had agreed on d-day and then at the last minute you're right churchill started getting cold feet you know and it's like well we you, you you know he started saying well let's land in britain instead you know let's not use normandy and they go but, but you know all this planning has been done it, it, it's been set in chain you can't you can't derail it now but it, <laughs> again you're right he he I think it was the burden of command that he realised that he was going to be responsible potentially for tens of thousands of deaths, you know, once the second front was open. Um, and so he, he I, got I, cold feet, you know. I, I, he, I, yeah. he lost that decisiveness that he normally showed. Well, I, I bring it up because you talk about the burden of command and you said it, Eisenhower, and uh, I mean, it was Marshall, Eis- uh, Marshall and uh, FDR who, and in, in even Eisenhower, who, who you know, you got one shoulder politics, one shoulder military, but Churchill had both of those. And just, just that reading about the dreams, the dreams of, of thousands of his countrymen dying. God, what a, what a, you know, on one hand, it's a burden, but the other look at the, just the, the, the magnificent victory that he was able, he was able to bring despite all that stress on him. Wow. That it's truly amazing. Well, and he had to run the civil administration as well, isn't he? I mean, we've discussed him as a war leader, but okay, you know, uh, but the same with America, you know, that both countries are at war, but the state still has to function. So for Churchill, we had to take all these decisions about, you know, what are we going to do about the coal mines? What are we doing about the railways, London Underground? Uh, what are we going to do about farming? What are we going to do about rationing? You know, there are a million and one um, civilian uh, decisions to be made. You know, what we're we going to do about civil defence, what will we do in the event of an invasion, what will we do with the civilian population, you know, will we evacuate them, all those sorts of things. So it wasn't just the strategic conduct of the war he had to think about. He also had to think about, you know, what's an acceptable uh, price for a loaf of bread, you know, all that sort of thing. You know, if we're introducing rationing, uh, how do we stop profiteering? Uh, you know, there's a war on and there's a blackout. What are you going to do to address crime? You know, all these 
mean and one other things that he had to contend with. They, um, I mean, it just it beggars belief the sort of things he had to think of. But he did it, you know. I feel like you and I could talk about this for three or four days straight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it's time to draw a line. And <laughs> well, look uh, for the audience here. Uh, I will. I will have the uh, the Amazon link to Miss uh, Anthony Tucker Jones' new book uh, on Churchill. Oh, I'm so excited! Yeah, uh, you have inspired me. I got. I got to read this now. I'm telling you, I can, <laughs> just what you're telling me. This is going to be required reading for my clients. Oh I man, ha- I have. I have a uh, newfound enthusiasm myself. I have to say, having finished the book and, you know, going through the production process, you feel a bit jaded by the time you've finished it, but actually it, it has reawakened my passion for the man. Oh, it's so exciting. So exciting. And again, congratulations. I know this has been a, tri- a, a trial. This has been a, 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 an odyssey, but good for you. I am so excited. Um, any last words for the audience? Um, I, I don't think so, other than uh, I hope you enjoy it. Oh, you know I will. I, I'm very excited. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Anthony Tucker-Jones, renowned, mil- international renowned military historian. Uh, your new book, oh boy, we're going to have, the, um, we're gonna have the, uh, the link in the bio. Make sure to get it. And if you have any questions uh, or feedback, please email me. I'll, I'll forward them to Mr. Anthony Tucker-Jones here. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Have a great day. If you like this content and want to hear other things like it, head on over to the website at blackmarketleadership.com. That's blackmarketleadership.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast and you can even create a free member's profile 